this is a message for the creative and the curious souls out there. So have you heard of the podcast, Your Own Magic? Your Own Magic is a podcast with hundreds of expansive guests from artists, authors, poets, activists, musicians, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, spiritual and intuitive guides, and so many unique specialties with people sharing their magic to stimulate your curiosity and excite you in the exploration and unleashing of your own magic. And I must say it is wild what you were able to heal and reveal within yourself when listening. So while you're tuned into the podcast you're currently listening to, search for and save for later the podcast Your Own Magic. It is hosted by me, Raquel Mantra, and tune in every Monday wherever you listen to podcasts. of households that start the year with Peloton are still active a year later. 92% because of a bike? Not just bikes. We also make treadmills and rowers. Oh, let me guess, for elite athletes only, right? Nope. It doesn't matter if you're an avid exerciser or new to working out. Peloton can help you achieve your fitness goals. 92% stick with it. So can you. Try Peloton bikes, tread or row, risk-free with a 30-day home trial. New members only. Not available in remote locations. See additional terms at onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. Welcome to episode 173 of Real Life Ghost Stories. To kick things off this week, I need to thank some of our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Neve Defley, Sarah, Haley Rivers, Annette Bedard, Kay, Marie Thorpe, Nicholas Seaton, Megan Medley, Simone Simpson, James Headley, Jessica Ward, Susan Gerendale, Anne Mall Sidhu. Melissa Purestinger, Callie Milsom, Kristen Hall, Emma Bukowski, Rachel Lol Lol, Sinead Mahan, and Kristen Edwards. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and I appreciate you every single day. And our film review this week, our film review is Lake Mungo. Lake Mungo was released in 2008. It has 6.3 out of 10 on IMDb and a whopping 96% on Rotten Tomatoes. Alice drowns while swimming and her family begin experiencing inexplicable events in their home. The family hires a parapsychologist whose investigation unveils Alice's secret double life and leads them to Lake Mungo. So let's do our likes and dislikes for this film. This film has been hotly requested for a very long time and it wasn't available on Amazon Prime for ages or Netflix or any other streaming service and now it is. I watched it on Amazon Prime. So let's get into the likes. Now, this is a documentary style movie, right? So imagine a true crime Netflix documentary but paranormal. That's it. That's what you've got. And usually documentary style interview movies give me the ick. I just don't think they work. I don't think documentary style interviews work in movies because people act too much. I don't really know how else to describe it. It's too acty and then it doesn't feel natural. Like you're looking at these interviews and you're like, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't like an interview. You are reading a script. You are doing a monologue right now that, and I'm watching you do a monologue. Actually, in this film... The interviews really worked and they were really believable. I feel like if somebody walked in who didn't know that I was watching a movie and saw me watching this, they would think that I was watching a documentary for for real. I, I really liked the acting in it, really. It was understated. It was clever. I believed the characters. So a wide range of characters are interviewed. You have Alice's parents, her brother, her boyfriend, her friends, uh, local police officers. So there's a really wide range of people who give their two cents into this story. I know there were people commenting being worried that it was a found footage film because found footage films can often make people feel sick because of the shaky camera. But this is not a found footage film. There's elements of found footage in it. There's elements of like kind of paranormal activity style static camera work. But other than that, it's pretty much interview um, interview shots. So you're not going to be feeling sick while you're watching it. 
this movie was not what I expected. And it really was what I thought to be a great exploration of grief. Um, The little boy next door is singing, by the way. So if you can hear like a, a high pitched sound, it's the little boy next door singing. I thought it was a really good exploration of grief. I'm not sure if that was the intention. I'm not sure if the movie like intended to make a commentary on grief and how different people grieve. Uh, but I felt like watching it, the way in which each of the family responded to the death of their loved one was really poignant. Even down to the mother insisting that the body be exhumed because she hasn't seen the body and she doesn't believe that the body is actually her daughter because she hasn't seen it. And I actually found that really heart-wrenching because I was watching her and thinking you haven't accepted the fact that your daughter's dead and you are clinging on to any possibility that she might still be alive, even if that means digging up this body and double checking. Um, And then there's a lot of commentary about the dad. So the dad like goes straight back to work. That's how he deals with it. And people are going, oh, you know, it's not how I'd deal with grief. So I really thought... I really thought that side of the story was really interesting, the exploration of grief and what grief makes people do. And also how when people are acutely grieving, their behavior becomes really bizarre and really strange. And sometimes the people around them don't know how to deal with that. And I just, I thought it was a really good exploration of all of those issues that surround grief. And you know what? I love saying this about films, but it was a really good use of special effects. In that there was very little, this was clearly a very low budget film, Basically, the special effects were like really basic photo manipulation, but it led to some very unsettling moments. They never tried to overdo it once. Not once. They didn't try to have like prolonged shots of like a creature walking through or really ghosty business going on. No, it was just like still frames, bits of video clips, but it was all very low budget, low key. And therefore, it really worked. I thought it really worked. It made me feel a bit unsettled. And every time they were showing like new evidence within the documentary, I was a bit on edge waiting to see what this new evidence would be, I have to say. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the dislikes. This is one of those films that I can't give too much away because I don't want to ruin the film for those who are planning watching it. So in terms of dislikes, I really did not enjoy the sexual elements. Um, If you've seen this film, you'll understand. I was really confused to the point of the sexual elements. I don't really know what it added I guess it added another layer to the character of Alice and added another like twist and turn to the story. But I just thought they were unnecessary. I don't think they added anything to the plot. I was confused as to the point of them. I didn't like the undertones of it. You know, she was a teenage girl. There's a lot of it that I thought I thought was problematic in that particular part of the storyline. I don't really know what they were trying to say. There was like hints of issues around consent and age and power dynamics in relationships but they were only hints they never the film never quite said anything about it and left it really ambiguous um besides that it was a bit slow at times and i think that was also due to the documentary style because everything has to be expositionary right so there were points when i was like okay this this film really needs to Hurry it up a little bit. Hurry it up a little bit. I'm I'm dying to know what happened, but I don't need another interview with the police officer. So let's move on a bit. Overall, I I was quite impressed with this movie. I really was. I was pleasantly surprised. I don't know if it deserves like a 96% on Rotten Tomatoes, but if you're looking for a kind of a fresh a fresh horror, uh it's not one that I've seen something similar to maybe ever or at least in a very long time. I'm definitely going to give it four stars out of five. So that's four stars out of five for Lake Mungo. Pretty much for originality. I believed it as a documentary style film. I liked the lack of CGI and the lack of special effects. There were elements of it that I found problematic and a bit slow. But in terms of like low budget originality, I was here for it. I feel like the way forward now is low budget films. Because they seem to be cleverer. You know, they seem to have to really rely on you know, little cinema trickery in order to make a scary film. I've been enjoying all the low budget horror that I have, um, that I've watched recently. Today's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. (laughs) 
I cannot keep risking life and limb in this zombie apocalypse to go to the grocery store. If only there was an easier way. Wait, what's this conveniently placed leaflet? With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and the impending zombie doom and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. You know what'll really take your mind off the flesh hungry horde? Fast and fresh recipes. HelloFresh's latest line of meals featuring robust flavours and filling portions are ready in less than 15 minutes. Enjoy taste and quality done quick with recipes like falafel power bowls, seared steak and potatoes with Bernays sauce or southwest pork and bean burritos and let's face it, in the zombie apocalypse we gotta cook smart and we gotta cook fast. And you know what? We don't all want to be out there fighting our way to the store so you can stock up on snacks, sides, desserts and more at HelloFresh Market. Simply add these staples and sweets to your weekly order and they'll arrive on your doorstep along with your meals. More yummy food, less mortal peril. Fictional zombie apocalypse aside, I have actually used HelloFresh in real life for years and I love it. I used them long before I ever advertised for them. It saved me so much time, so much money and so much food waste. I'm also not a very good cook, so it allows me to cook and eat better. Go to HelloFresh.com slash RealLifeGhostStories22 and use the code RealLifeGhostStories22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash RealLifeGhostStories22 and use code Real Life Ghost Stories 22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. Oh no. Oh no, what is that? Oh no, no, it was meant to be fictional. It wasn't meant to be real. Which brings us to our story. Now I'm just going to jump straight into the story. I'm not going to give it any build up, any lead up. It sort of links to the film, which doesn't happen very often. But when it does, I feel very proud of myself. So let's get into it. In recent months, I have been celebrating the news that the story of Jeff the Mongoose is being turned into a film. And if that sentence has you confused, I would implore you to go back and listen to episode 79, The Dolby Spook, and thank me later. One of the key players in the story of Jeff the Talking Mongoose was Nandor Fodor. Nandor Fodor was born on May the 13th in 1895 in Hungary. He obtained a law degree in 1917 and subsequently obtained a doctorate. He worked as a journalist from 1921 to 1928 and moved to New York. During this time, he came across a book called Modern Psychic Phenomena, and he became so intrigued by the idea of psychic phenomena that it became the primary concern of his research. Fodor combined his interest in psychic phenomena with his interest in psychoanalysis, which offered a unique insight into paranormal phenomena. In 1935, the International Institute for Psychical Research was formed and Fodor became its research officer. And as a result, he became the key player in a strange little case that happened in the London borough of Croydon. It was February 1938 and the wind howled through the streets of Croydon and rain and sleet battered the footpaths. Alma Fielding was curled up in bed, moaning softly in pain. She had had kidney issues pretty much all her life and had been bed-bound for three days. Luckily, she wasn't alone in bed. Her husband Leslie had had multiple teeth pulled and his gums were agonisingly painful and constantly seeping blood. They weren't in a good way but it would pass. In the slow days of recovery, Alma began to be able to sit up in her bed and she noticed something strange. A handprint on the mirror above the fireplace in her room. But this handprint was abnormal. It had six fingers. It was the Friday night and Leslie and Alma were still in their sickbed when something smashed in the darkness of the room. The shattering of glass pierced the thick silence of their bedroom and no sooner had they turned the light on and a glass tumbler sailed across the room and burst against the wall. 
As they sat and stared, a wind whipped up in their bedroom and Alma instinctively cried out. Their son Donald ran into their bedroom and ducked as a pot flew straight at his head and their lodger George was hit by a shilling and a penny. The room went dark and when candles were eventually lit, the bulb had been removed and was sitting still hot on a chair against the wall. Eventually, the house went quiet and the Fieldings and George managed to get some sleep. The next morning the phenomena continued and Alma, unsure of who to call, placed a call into the Sunday pictorial imploring them to come and visit her house. When the reporters were in the house they witnessed objects flying around. A cup and saucer rose from Alma's hands and exploded in mid-air. Alma was injured by a second cup exploding and the reporters were absolutely baffled. The front page story the next day screamed of a haunted house in Croydon and Nandor Fodor was hooked. Fodor knocked on the door of the Fielding's house and was brimming with anticipation. Leslie Fielding opened the door, looking shook and pale. He had dark rings under his eyes and he welcomed Fodor inside. Over the intervening days, the house had become a war zone. A wardrobe was smashed, as well as pots, glasses, eggs, plates, bowls, egg cups and a clock. All the fieldings were exhausted. It had been relentless. And because of the media coverage, people were incessantly peeping in the windows, trying to catch a glimpse of the poltergeist activity. Fodor set about observing the family and chatting to them at intervals throughout the day. The family were decidedly normal, albeit shook up after the events of the past few days. Alma spoke at length about the things that had been happening. She had cuts and bruises from where items had hit her or shattered in her hands. She claimed that every so often she had had prophetic dreams, but had thought little of them. But now she wondered if she might be psychic. Was she the cause of all of these strange events? The lid of a saucepan had disappeared and reappeared in an upstairs room, cocked jauntily on the head of a teddy bear. Alma had heard voices in the sitting room, and the phenomena was witnessed by multiple people. Reporters, family members, friends, investigators. Fodor even noted that there were times when phenomena occurred, that Alma had her hands in a sink of water, for example, or she had been carrying a tray and a completely separate and random item had been flung across a room. There really did seem to be no scientific explanation for what was happening in this house. Fodor was excited. While there was potential for a rational explanation in some of the incidents, others were trickier to explain. 16-year-old Donald was so frightened by the phenomena in the house that he had chosen to move out, so couldn't be responsible for the incidents. Leslie worked daily as a painter and decorator and was not present for many of the events. That only left Alma. But there had been so many incidents that seemed to happen when Alma couldn't have been the perpetrator. Reporters literally noted that she had her hands in a sink of soapy water when one incident happened. In this particular incident, a reporter stated that a saucepan had apparently materialised out of thin air next to his head and bounced against the wall opposite. Cups and glasses had lifted out of her hands and shattered in mid-air. Lumps of coal flew out of the grate. And the incidents were happening in public. When Alma was out for tea with a friend, her cup had lifted out of her hand and shattered. In another establishment, she left the bathroom and it was witnessed that while Alma was in full view, a scrubbing brush and a soap tray sailed out the door behind her. Alma agreed readily to go to Fodor's offices for extensive examination. On arrival, she readily agreed to be searched and happily obliged with all requests that were made of her. She was unflustered and calm and sat in a large study room in order to be observed. She paced the brightly lit room with her hands clasped around a glass of water. Nothing happened. Fodor had filled the room with various trigger objects. Glasses and cups and saucers were propped on various surfaces in the hope to lure out Alma's ghost. Sometime into the study, a thump was heard in the room and the researchers found a brass-bound brush had landed in the room. 
it was still warm. Alma identified it as her own brush that she had left in her bedroom at home. Sometime later, a pot of over-the-counter laxatives clattered to the floor, again still warm, which Alma identified as last being seen on her dresser at home. Alma was placed sitting in a cabinet, covered on three sides and being observed by the researchers who sat in front of her. A glass dome from her son Donald's bedroom appeared on the chair behind her. As she sat drinking a cup of tea, the teacup sprang from her hands and the researchers watched it shatter, as if it had been hit with a bullet in the air. In the car journey home, the strange events continued. A plate rose into the air and snapped. Alma's shoe disappeared and reappeared, as did a glove she was wearing, and her hat, and a clip. The hair clip later reappeared in Fodor's pocket. Fodor sat in the back of the car with her, holding her hands and could find no explanation for these events. Later, a researcher named Dr. Wills and Fodor placed Dr. Wills' overcoat on Alma and placed items in the pockets which disappeared and reappeared. What was even more interesting was that Alma was genuinely frightened when the phenomena occurred. Her pulse and heart rate were checked regularly and when an incident occurred, her heart rate would leap up and her pulse would race. The investigations into the phenomena around Alma Fielding continued. Fodor and his team took Alma to Bognor Regis, a seaside town in the south of England, in order to see if a change of scenery would impact the poltergeist activity. Alma had spoken about jewellery that would disappear off shop counters and appear around her neck or on her fingers, and it made it so that she refused to touch jewellery in shops just in case. One time when she was in the back of a car with Fodor, a ring had appeared on her finger, much to both of their shock. In Bognor Regis, they decided to test this theory and sent Alma into a shop closely flanked by the researchers. On their instruction, she picked a ring and examined it. Every member of the team witnessed Alma physically hand the ring back to the shop assistant. When they exited the shop, the ring had appeared on Alma's finger. The investigations into Alma Fielding continued, and during these sessions, strange items and trinkets continued to materialise around her. Each time she was investigated, it was in the psychical research offices. Prior to each session, she was strip-searched, each item of her clothing was individually searched, and she was under permanent supervision, including by female staff who accompanied her to the toilet. At home, the incidents continued. Alma had told reporters and neighbours that the house had gone quiet, tired of the constant scrutiny from outsiders. But the Fielding family reported to Nandor Fodor and his team that the incidents continued. In one incident, as Alma leaned over Les to wake him up from a nap, a shower of fresh violets had fallen into her lap. They were wet with dew and smelled heavily. That day, 17 years earlier, Alma and Les had been married, and on their wedding day, Alma had carried a bouquet of violets. After the sweet scent of violets had disappeared, the smell was replaced by the stench of rotting meat, which they could find no source for. The Fielding's lodger, George, was also experiencing the phenomena, and in a strange little incident, Les Fielding heard George cry out in the night, No, please, please no, stay away from me. The next morning, George was visibly shook and explained to Les that in the night he had heard a noise in his bedroom, and as he had turned over to investigate, the light turned on. Standing with her hand on the light switch was Alma, wearing a red nightdress, her face distorted into an evil smile, staring silently at George. Les insisted it was a dream, as Alma had been asleep beside him during the disturbance but George was convinced it was real. And if it was a dream, who turned on the light? This seems to be the first instance in a series of reported astral projections. Alma reported being at the cinema, falling into a trance, and somehow finding herself outside of the psychical research offices, with no idea how she had gotten there. Her presence outside of the offices was confirmed by a chauffeur who had seen her, and thought that there was something strange about her. 
According to Alma, she had been at the cinema the entire time. More jewellery appeared, including a Byzantine choker, like something from a museum, which was red hot and burned her neck. And then the animals began to appear. White mice in her collar, a goldfish appeared in her vest. In one of the seances, a researcher requested that if the poltergeist was capable of materialising animals, then perhaps it could materialise a waxbill finch, a bird native to Indonesia. And sure enough, in the session that followed, a small pink and grey bird materialised and flew from Alma Fielding's skirt and perched on a bookshelf. It was a waxbill finch. The animal materialisations didn't end there. In one incident, in a car, a small terrapin appeared in Alma's lap, the sight of which made her scream and panic. Similarly, in another incident, a beetle appeared inside Alma's sock. Her clothes had been thoroughly checked and her high socks had been sewn to her underwear, but yet the dead scarab beetle had materialised somehow. As the investigations progressed, things became more and more disturbing. Alma began to suffer from intense night terrors. She talked about hearing the fluttering and flapping of wings in her bedroom, which was verified by Les. Les had become frightened to sleep in their bed at night time after being racked by night terrors and feeling the icy cold presence next to the bed at night time. In one incident, Alma had rang Fodor early in the morning to report an experience that she had had the night before. She had awoken to a feeling of terror and heard the now familiar fluttering of wings around her room. She felt a cold presence in the room and smelled the stench of death. She felt a pain in her neck and the feeling of her blood being drained from her. She likened the sensation to a time post-surgery when she had lost a lot of blood in a short space of time and felt herself sinking into oblivion. That morning when she had woken up she felt horrendous and when she looked at herself in the mirror, she noticed two puncture wounds in her neck. Fodor listened with scepticism, and decided that he would go to her house unannounced with a doctor in order to at least verify the supposed injuries. When Fodor arrived, Alma looked wretched, surprised to see him, but wretched nonetheless, and on her neck were two definite puncture wounds. Alma had injuries all over her body. There were scratches, burns and puncture wounds that would appear at random on her. But there were elements of the investigation that had concerned Fodor. For different reasons. When Fodor was sitting in the back seat of the car when the ring appeared on Alma's finger, he could have sworn he saw her hand move. A brief flash. But it happened. And to him it was significant. And it would ultimately lead to his downfall. There was something about the disappearing and reappearing jewellery that stood out to him. What did it mean and why would it happen? The entity or the poltergeist would present Alma with these items and she would in turn gift them to others. The Fieldings were not a poor family by any means and Les earned £50 more per year than the average person in the area. So Alma could have bought these items if she had wanted. But she never returned the jewellery that the poltergeist acquired. She always kept it and gifted it to other people. There was something that just wasn't sitting right about the whole situation. And he decided that the only way to understand what was happening to Alma Fielding was to give her an x-ray at the beginning of their next session. He did, but he sprung it on her. And Alma reluctantly agreed. And there on the x-ray, concealed in Alma's clothes next to her chest, was a silver hat pin and a silver locket, which later appeared during a seance. Nandor Fodor was devastated. Alma Fielding was apparently a fraud. But was she? Fodor had seen strange and wonderful things happen around her with his own eyes. He had physically seen in one seance two vivid red marks appear around her neck after she said she had felt suffocated by a presence. And her hands had never moved. What did that mean? 
Was some of the phenomena real and some of it not? He had also witnessed her slyly blowing on the neck of a researcher during a seance. And another time, he believed he had witnessed her throw something down the stairs behind her. All of the researchers that had met her had believed her, the reporters, her family and friends. And in order to get to the truth, he had to do a little digging. Alma Fielding had married at 17 and was pregnant when she got married. Throughout her interactions with the researchers, she would drop little nuggets of information every now and then that would paint quite a startling picture. Her family had disapproved of her marriage to Les, and as an adult she found life with him boring. There seemed to be some dalliance between her and George the Lodger, but it would appear that it had not become physical. Alma had an older sister who her mother vocally preferred, and there was more than a suggestion that Alma had been sexually abused as a child. She was trained by her uncle to be a circus performer, but her career as a performer had been cut short when she was injured in a cycling accident. She was plagued by illness throughout her life. After the cycling accident, her kidneys were damaged, and she had multiple surgeries to drain abscesses that had formed on her kidneys. She had developed breast cancer and had to have a mastectomy and radium treatment. Her son had died, and she had lost two other babies at birth. After her son died, she contracted anthrax from her toothbrush. It is highly unusual for a human to contract anthrax from an animal, but it was believed that she had contracted it from an infected animal bristle on her toothbrush. The illness caused her gums to go black, and during this period of time, she attacked Leslie with a knife and ran out into the street screaming and crying murder all of her teeth were removed. It was later speculated that perhaps Leslie having his teeth removed had triggered a trauma response from Alma because that was when all of the phenomena started. Leslie had fought in the Great War and had been badly injured by shrapnel in the back of his thigh, an injury which still caused him issues. He regularly suffered from night terrors where he dreamed that he was on the front line and his throat was slit by enemy soldiers. And at the time in London, tensions were high. Hitler was on the move in Europe, and the threat of war was imminent. For Leslie and Alma, they must have realised that a war brewing would mean that their teenage son would likely be conscripted. It was a time where spiritualism was at its peak in London, seances were booming post-World War I and with the impending doom of World War II. Poltergeist cases were widely reported in the media and newspapers regularly ran call-outs for ghost stories from members of the public. Only weeks before, there had been a really popular story about a reported poltergeist in Bethnal Green. There had recently been adaptations of Dracula that had hit the cinema screens, which went some way to explaining the ideas around vampirism. It seems that for Alma Fielding there was a perfect storm of local, national and personal circumstances to accommodate the perfect poltergeist case. The poltergeist provided Alma with the things that didn't exist in her life. It provided her with a voice. She could express inner anger and rage by smashing items around her house. She gained attention which she quickly realised was not what she wanted when people were knocking on her windows and waiting outside her house to see the ghost. But within the research community, she was showered with attention. People listened to her and they believed her. She was special and she could escape her mundane everyday life. Through seances and hypnotism, she created different voices with which she could further express herself. She could be a cool, calm, authoritative spirit guide and quash the cynics with another voice. But she also sometimes spoke in the voice of a small child who was calling out for their mother. Is it possible that Alma Fielding had such suppressed trauma that she manifested some of the events? Often there were people who testified that there was no way Alma could have done the things that happened in front of them. Did she do some of them? and not do others? Or was it all a big hoax? And then there was one further moment. When Alma Fielding reported that she could astral project, the team of researchers set up a test where she would go to the cinema 
an attempt to project to the offices of psychical research, just like she had apparently done before. On the night in question, she claimed that she tried and tried and tried to project, but found it really difficult. She projected to the offices, but no one could see her. But she claimed that she had knocked on Nandor Fodor's office door. He must have heard it, she said. I know you heard it. And sure enough, at around nine o'clock the previous evening, Nandor Fodor had heard a soft knock on his office door. But when he investigated, there was no one there. What a story. This has been my favourite story for a really long time. So my information came from a book called The Haunting of Alma Fielding by Kate Summerscale. It is an absolutely fantastic book, particularly if you're interested in like the psychology of the paranormal. It goes through all of the events that happened to Alma Fielding and they are, there are so many events, like so many paranormal things happened around that woman, so many poltergeist events, there, there is so much and it's all documented in this book and it is a very interesting look into how the landscape of paranormal investigation began to change around this period. Nandor Fodor, I said that the realisation that Alma Fielding might not be genuine, as in a genuine paranormal case, was his downfall. And it was his downfall because he ended up getting fired. So he was adamant that what was happening was because of repressed sexual trauma. Because Alma Fielding had been sexually abused. He believed had been sexually abused as a child. There was a lot of suggestion of it. Things that Alma said in the seances would also suggest that things had happened to her as a child. She never outright said it. She never came out and said it. But even reading the events that took place the things that she said as somebody who has worked with abused children it yeah you could see things that she said that would make you go oh no that's not good that 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 doesn't have good implications so Nandor Fodor loved a bit of Freud and he was really interested in Freudian parapsychology so he was interested in really what sexual trauma and repressed sexuality can do to a person's psyche and can it create this paranormal activity But actually, a lot of researchers and reporters didn't like that point of view. They didn't like the idea that paranormal activity could actually be kind of written off as being psychological. And as a result of this, the Psychical Research Institute, they didn't want to risk their reputation. And they ended up firing him, even though he did the bulk of the work for the Institute for a really long time. But they ended up firing him and he was outraged by it. He was outraged because his belief wasn't that there was no paranormal activity. He believed that a traumatized brain had the ability to create energy that would cause this paranormal activity. And I think kind of reading reading the story and uh, reading what happened later in his life, I think he really did believe that some of the stuff that happened around Alma Fielding was genuinely paranormal and caused by her, all of the trauma she'd experienced in her life from all of the illnesses, her Um, children dying sexual abuse all of those things he believed they had contributed to her mind creating this crazy energy and that that she was able to kind of manipulate the world around her in a different way but he also believed that some of it she did just fake he was a jewish man and lost a lot of his family during world war ii Uh, they had stayed in hungary and they were persecuted by the nazis he ended up in new york and he was a pretty good parapsychologist you know that's that's what he dedicated his life to and one of his prized possessions that he had framed in his office was a letter from Freud and in the letter Freud said that he agreed that the paranormal activity that surrounded Alma Fielding was because of repressed trauma particularly childhood sexual trauma so in this case the question really isn't about whether or not these things happened they did happen lots of people witnessed them Lots of people witnessed them multiple times at different occasions, on different occasions. They did happen. The question is whether or not they were paranormal. And whether or not you fall down the side of they were all orchestrated by Alma Fielding. Or whether there was really some paranormal activity that surrounded her. But she then faked some of the stuff that happened. We saw this in the Enfield poltergeist case where the girls in the house said that they felt this immense pressure to perform for all of the like researchers and reporters that would come in. So they said that 99% of the activity was real 
but every so often they would fake things to either wind up people or they would do it because they felt the pressure to perform in front of people. And there is evidence of Alma Fielding genuinely she would take the pace, she would pull pranks on people, but she wouldn't keep it, she wouldn't make it a secret. Uh, there was one There was one incident where um, her son and somebody else were in the attic looking at a train set and she turned to Nandor Fodor and she was like, oh, let's move the ladder up to the attic and pretend that the poltergeist did it. And they did it like giggling away like children, you know what I mean? So she did pull pranks and she did have like a silly sense of humour about it at times. And I don't know what I believe. I don't know which side that I come down on personally. I think that trauma does huge amounts of things to people. We all know that. But do I think that there was something that happened in that house? I don't know. And it's difficult to know whether or not. So she something happened in the house. You know whatever happened. Whether or not it was poltergeist activity. Whatever it was. Something happened in the house and then she got all this attention from all these researchers who were like doctors, countesses, like Nandor Fodor was like, you know, a very eminent parapsychologist in the in the area. Like, did she go, oh, I have all this attention now from these people. I'm going to have to like up the game. I'm going to have to start doing things in order to impress them. They did establish that she had the bird um, was in a uh, like a handkerchief that was tied around her knee under her skirt so she had that's how she'd gotten the bird in there were at the time there were terrapins for sale in Woolworths on the counter and they reckon that she nicked one of the terrapins but she must have been really good at it that's the thing that gets me she must have been really good at it like in the incidents with the jewelry for example like other people were there and witnessed it happening so other people saw her like in the incident where all the researchers were there they saw her giving the ring back to the shopkeeper they physically saw her doing it so unless she had all these elaborate plans and elaborate ways to do all these things I don't know like surely they would have been really hard to fake especially when all these eyes were on her all the time I just I just don't know how she could have gotten away with it and the only thing I can think of is that they realised after a while that she was concealing stuff within some of her clothes, but she was also concealing stuff within her vagina. And I'm not going to go into like loads of gory details about it. And it, that whole part of the story is very problematic. And in later life, Nandor Fodor talked about how actually his behaviour around it was really problematic. And he got completely sidelined by figuring out the mystery and forgot about the fact that at the centre of this was a traumatised woman and that he, he believed that his behaviour did not help in the situation and and I thought it was like fair play to him for reflecting on that but but his behavior was very problematic but they established that she would conceal items in her vagina and then somehow get them out and fling them across the room I still can't quite figure out how you know I'm not a doctor I I'm no doctor but there's elements of that part of the story that make me go really did she Did she really do that or are you looking for a convenient explanation? I mean, it's also very symbolic to conceal things within your vagina and then release them when needed. It's very symbolic. But I I don't I don't know how much I agree with that. And that's the second time in in a couple of weeks where we've had incidents where people have allegedly kept things in their vaginas. So I don't know what's going on with that. And it just seems like a really instantaneous plan so she like this all of the, the, these events have happened only in the space of a couple of months so she stuff is like flying around her house she didn't have stuff in her vagina then surely and stuff is like being flung around her house and then she's called to these offices she immediately goes there and suddenly she's really skilled at like concealing things and not getting caught or was it a case that when the when the kind of veil was lifted and people started to see oh actually this is what's going on then suddenly the deceit became really obvious. You know when you really want something to be true, you get blinded by all of the things that show you that it's false. Either way, there's something about this story that just, I find it really fascinating. I would massively recommend the book The Haunting of Alma Fielding by Kate Summerscale. It's told in a way where she really explores the parapsychology and the psychoanalysis elements of it, but not in a stuffy difficult to understand kind of way like she it's very straightforward and it's written like a narrative so it's an interesting read I don't know what I think really I think that Alma Fielding was a very traumatized woman I think awful things happened to her I don't think she was ever able to address the awful things that happened to her and I think that 
that manifested itself in this poltergeist case. Do I think it was really a poltergeist? Probably not. Do I think maybe weird things happened in the house and it led to attention for Alma Fielding and then therefore she upped the ante and started faking things? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Do I think all of those researchers just wanted a free fucking holiday to Bognor Regis? Yeah, they definitely did. What was the point of bringing her to Bognor Regis? Please explain to me why they all thought it was the next best thing in paranormal research to bring her to the seaside. Are you joking me? They all just wanted a free holiday. That is so obvious to me. Anyway, I am rambling now. I'm, r- I'm talking myself around in circles. So let me know what you think. Let me know how much of it you think is paranormal. Do you think all of it is paranormal? None of it is paranormal. What do you think was going on with Alma Fielding? And like I said, if you're interested in parapsychology, if you're interested in psychoanalysis, if you're interested in the psychology behind this haunting, The Haunting of Alma Fielding by Kate Summerscale is the book to buy. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you would like to send in your ghost story, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. You can check out everything you need to know about Real Life Ghost Stories on the website, reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for extra content, you can sign up for $5 or $2 a month to our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content. And on that note, I shall see you next time. When you visit Arizona, time is measured in moments, not minutes. Like the moment you see the Grand Canyon for the first time. Visit a new state of mind. Learn more at hereyouareaz.com.